Uh, hi. Um, my talk is going to be about characterizing test time compute on graph structured problems. Um, most of my scholars project has been spent thinking about uh, this question of whether we can uh, create models that continuously improve their outputs, the more compute that we give them at test time. This is something that I'll call the test time compute dream. And I think there's much anthropomorphic motivation here. After all, as humans, when we're being evaluated, our answers tend to become better the longer we're given to think. Machine learning models, for the most part, don't exhibit this ability, which seems a little weird. So I tend to bucket this test time compute stuff into two general categories. One is generalization improvement mechanisms, which deal with the question of how can we create models that use test time compute to learn more general algorithms instead of learning simple statistical associations and data. Ideally, we'd like these models to use the extra compute to resolve ambiguity and to correct and refine their own answers. The second side of this coin is um, efficiency stuff. And this deals with the question of how we can decouple the amount of parameters that a model has from uh, the amount of time that it takes to run the model at inference, with the motivation here being that if we can construct models that are larger, but that don't incur a larger computational cost for those extra uh, parameters, then we win. Okay, so how did we uh, tackle this question? Um, the overwhelming vast majority of this project was actually spent on something I'll likely only spend a single slide talking about in the interest of time. And that's the shortest path task. Uh, shortest path is a sequence to sequence modeling task in which I give the model a pair of tokens representing pairs of US cities. And I expect it to output a sequence of target tokens that represent the uh, shortest path between the destinations. The stuff I'll mostly be presenting on only really took shape in the past three or four weeks, and it involved investigating some of these test time properties on uh, graph neural networks operating over the game of Sudoku. Okay, like I said, most of my project was spent on the shortest path work, in which we were trying to answer this question. If we control the flop, the total flop budget of um, our models, is there ever a point where the test time performance of models like the one that you see on the left, which use this sort of top layer recurrence, ever begins to approach or match the performance of models that don't have this recurrence, but maybe are larger or have been trained for longer? The way we did this was by keeping the training compute budget in terms of flops fixed for all the models and then training these recurrent models with a fixed number of time steps during training with loss evaluated at every single time step, and then during test time, evaluating them with more steps of recurrence to see if it ever reaches a point where the extra compute allows them to, in some sense, catch up to the larger models that were trained without this uh, recurrence. Long story short, it largely doesn't seem to work. We never really see this sort of phase transition. Recurrence alone doesn't seem to be enough. To be clear, if you run a linear probe on the embedding space for these models, um, they actually seem to learn something like the locations or something at least isometric to the locations of the cities fairly quickly, which indicates that the problem isn't actually learning where the cities are. It seems to be that even with the extra recurrence, the extra compute, learning a general shortest path algorithm is difficult. Occurrence alone doesn't seem to be enough. We need additional structure on top of that. Um, which is where the graph neural network stuff comes in. So graph neural networks are networks that operate on graph structured data. There are a few main parts. The first part is this input representation phase where you pass in your graph structured data. X here represents the nodes in your graph which contain the features that you care about. These could be the locations of US cities or the values of cells on a Sudoku board. A represents the adjacencies, which um, encode some concept of the edges of the graph. In other words, what relationships nodes have with each other. Uh, the GNN processes this graph by iteratively performing a learned message passing operation between the nodes where it attempts to refine its internal representation of those nodes. At the end of this refinement phase, we can then run classification tasks on either the individual nodes, or if we aggregate uh, the nodes we can run classification on the entire graph. 
Okay, a key feature of these GNNs is this graph refinement equation, which I'll come back to at least twice in this presentation. Um, it looks wild in its general form, but all it really is is just three parts. Um, it says that the hidden state for a node i is updated by a function that takes in the node embedding for that node and all pairs of that node's neighbors pass through some function and then aggregated using your favorite aggregation function. Cool. Okay, so how do we do this for Sudoku? Well, every cell on the Sudoku board corresponds to a node on the graph. Um, this node on the graph, the nodes on this graph refine their representations by passing messages to themselves or, or their neighbors using that graph refinement equation we just saw. And now what's typically done is that you run this graph um, refinement phase for a fixed number of time steps, say 10 time steps. And then at the very end, you run your linear projection and you make a prediction. What we do a little differently here is that we make a prediction at every point along the graph refinement phase and we evaluate the loss at every single point as well. This allows the model to be more robust to being evaluated during the graph refinement, to being evaluated with more graph refinement iterations at test time than it was trained on um, at, inference, at, at training. Okay, so how does this actually look like in practice? Here's one solving Sudoku. This is real data, by the way. What's cool about this is that it appears to prioritize spending the extra compute resources on attending to and refining tokens that it assigned a low probability, high uncertainty to in the previous time steps. The red things, become more green and the green things stay green. Okay, this is cool because it's a sign that the test time compute dream is at least in principle possible. If we look at this graph, which shows the GNN operating over two data sets, one is normal and the other is hard, we see generalization in two different senses. One, as we increase the amount of iterations for test time compute, we see that the accuracy of the network improves in an almost monotonically increasing way. By the way, the accuracy here is measured on the sequence level, which means that it, I only count it if it gets the entire board correct. The other sense is that if we give the network problems that are harder than um, the ones it was trained on, it still performs well. Okay, so if the argument here is that more test time compute, more iterations is good, what would happen if we could evaluate this model at infinite depth? In other words, could we do better? Um, in order to answer this question, we need to steal the machinery of deep equilibrium models. Now, I don't have a whole lot of time to go into the details of deep equilibrium models, but I suggest that you check out uh, the paper by Shaju Bai or the Europe's um, workshop from this past year. The gist is that deep equilibrium models are inspired by the observation that we can often rewrite uh, a standard neural network as an implicit function. That instead of specifying explicitly how to compute the layer's output as a function of its input, we instead specify the conditions in which we would like the layer's output to satisfy. After rewriting these layers as implicit functions, it turns out that most of them converge to a fixed point, which allows us to, instead of keeping track of the intermediaries of that graph refinement phase in our autograd library, we could instead use an arbitrary black box root finding algorithm and to evaluate this convergence point. This is equivalent to running an infinite depth weight tied feed forward network, but has the notable advantage that we can analytically back propagate through this equilibrium point using something called the implicit function theorem. Cool. Um, yeah, how's this relevant to GNNs? Well, if you take a look at that graph refinement equation from earlier, it looks exactly like a fixed point equation, which means that we can apply the machinery of deep equilibrium nets here. If you try this out, it actually uh, works really well with a big caveat that I'll related to early stopping that I'll get to in the next slide. These early training curves are preliminary, but kind of dramatic. The deep equilibrium, uh, sorry, the deep equilibrium uh, GNN trains a lot faster than the traditional GNN. Further, because we're using the machinery of deep equilibrium nets to save us from having to keep track of the intermediate steps of the, that graph refinement phase in our autograd library, the memory usage of the deep equilibrium net is smaller than the regular one as well. Okay, so what's the caveat? Well, uh, as far as I can tell, every single time I've, been, uh, I've run this, I've run into this weird collapse that happens where it starts training and it's doing really great and then it dies. 
And I haven't quite been able to figure out why this happens. I suspect it has to do with the growth of the spectral norm of the operators inside the GNN as it's being evaluated by the fixed point iterator, but it also just could be a bug in my code. Um, stopping training early when this degeneracy begins is proven to be fine. And I'm still investigating the problem, but I just wanted to point this out for completeness. Okay. Shifting gears a little bit, can we do better still in another way? GNNs are fine. As we've seen, they seem to do well on these relational reasoning style tasks. But one potential oddity is that we must be explicit about the network, the structure of the network of the graph. That is, we must explicitly tell the network which nodes are connected to which other nodes. For Sudoku, for instance, we must be explicit about saying that things that are in the same row, things that are in the same column, things that are in the same cell are connected. Could we instead learn the adjacencies from scratch from the raw unstructured data? Here's the idea. Okay, transformers seem to be pretty good at learning how, um, how relevant pairs of tokens are to each other. On the other hand, GNNs are good at operating over structured data. What if we could use the attention head from a standard transformer to extract an adjacency matrix, which we then feed into the GNN? Here's how it works. We first feed a small transformer, our input, with a small modification that at the top layer, we use the probability scores to categorically sample the top K indices, which are the most relevant to that particular token. That extracts K neighborhoods for each token, which we can then feed into our GNN. Now, sampling indices is a non-differentiable operation. However, we can compensate for this by using the surrogate loss thing outlined below. This is taken from a paper by John Schulman, and uh, it just provides a general framework for gradient estimation through stochastic compute graphs. The formulism just gives us a way to convert stochastic compute graphs into deterministic compute graphs and evaluate a surrogate loss using standard backpropagation that provides an unbiased estimator of the gradient through the stochastic node. Cool. Okay, so if you try this out, it works, kind of. Um, the reality is that it, this trains much slower than the standard GNN. Um, and, you know, vanilla policy gradients that are high variance, that are kind of messy. But, uh, and the performance actually is worse than the standard GNN, but it does show that in principle, we could train a GNN from scratch that learns the adjacencies from scratch as well, which is kind of cool. Okay. Conclusion, yeah. So uh, test time compute mechanisms, I think are largely underexplored, but hold much promise. They have the potential for improved generalization mechanisms, potential for improved sample efficiency, I think recurrence plus message passing seems to be a really interesting combination. And if the methods of this presentation seem uh, contrived, that's because they are. Uh, but ultimately, like I'm, while the specific methods are kind of crude, I'm bullish on the idea of test time compute in general. And I think that the next few years we'll see critical breakthroughs that make use of ideas that have test time compute at their core. That's it. Uh, I'd like to thank my mentor, Will Guess, and I'd also like to thank uh, the program organizers and my cohort and uh, all the people that um, gave me early feedback on uh, some of this stuff. And thank you. And now I'll take questions. Uh, let's see, let me stop sharing. Okay, so. This first question here is, how do I extend this GNN setting to sequence modeling, like the language modeling loss in uh, GPT? Yeah, so um, you could imagine that each output token corresponds to either, uh, yeah, you, you could do this in a couple of ways. Like you could imagine like an autoregressive type thing where like you're at each point evaluating the state of the entire graph and outputting an output sequence and then feeding that output sequence into uh, the sort of beginning of the model and then running this again and doing this sort of autoregressively is one way. Um, and then, yeah, but I'm sure there are other ways that I'm just not familiar with. But yeah, so. What type of problems do you expect test time to compute to really shine in? 
Yeah, this is a great question. I think, sorry, my, my dog gets really excited here. Uh, I think ultimately uh, test time compute will shine in uh, problems that really have sort of these relational reasoning style tasks where we need to um, relate our previous outputs to uh, things that we're currently processing or problems where we need to condition the amount of compute that we do on the complexity of our inputs. Okay. Uh, does the stochastic compute graph mean that GNNs can be applied to settings without inductive biases? That's the ultimate hope. I think this is just very crude early work that shows that you could potentially also just learn the adjacencies without hand uh, baking the inductive bias. Though, I mean, I think part of the appeal of graph neural networks is that like, they're so easy to bake in inductive biases that you just feed in the, the, the graph as it is, and that is the inductive bias for your data. So there's definitely a trade-off here, and it's not like super clear that doing this is like always the right thing to do. Okay, last question. What does it look like if you threshold the learned adjacency weights to produce a discrete graph structure? Is, is this roughly right? Threshold the learned adjacency weights. Oh, right. So yeah, that's that's a good point. The, these are discrete. That's the whole point of the sampling thing is that the adjacencies are the indices for each token, which correspond to the other tokens that are, are, um, that are near it. So this isn't like a tension where we're doing like a soft max over, over, um, over the other output tokens. Like we're using the uh, transformers probability scores, and then we're discreetly sampling like which we're using the transformers attention uh, scores as our weights for our discrete sampling, if that makes sense. Um, but yeah, cool. I think I'm over time. So um, yeah, I'll hand it back over to Francis, I guess.